Hi, this is Matt Marchant, and this is the virtual class for the Roots of Self-Sabotage from March 2nd, 2013. Thank you for joining me, and I am very excited to talk about this subject. Uh, hopefully that doesn't mean that um, I enjoy sabotaging myself, but let's find out. So um, this is lesson one in a four-part series, and for the entire series, there is a theme. The theme that I have kind of projected onto these classes is this. Creating an inner awareness and understanding of our responsibility. Now, when I use the word responsibility, I'm uh, really referencing our choices. But for me, that would be my theme uh, for these four classes for myself. We'll see if that works for you. So I'd like to start off by asking this question. Does self-control require self-awareness? Uh, for me, that's why I'm here, that's why I'm uh, studying this stuff, is that I believe that in order for me to find um, some self-control, the, the opposite of my sabotaging behavior, I need some self-awareness. So hopefully in this class we will gain uh, some self-awareness. So, learning objectives for lesson one. Number one, to create a better understanding of what we want in life. This is my goal with this class, is we're gonna look at just the first step, the first stage, sometimes they even call it the first realm of what's called the literal. Let's find out what we literally want in life. It might seem a, a pretty easy question to answer, what do you want in life, but it might be harder than you think. So the, the, the objective of this class is to find out what is it that we want, really kind of just um, either nail it down and figure that out or at least walk away understanding that I need to spend some time really thinking on what I want in life. Number two, to create a greater awareness of how we might be sabotaging our own growth and goals. So let me start real quickly in just telling you a bit about my journey and how I've gotten here um, with my own concepts of self-sabotage. Um, more or less, there's two schools of thought when it comes to self-sabotage. You have one, which I call the Nike uh, plan, which is the just do it. So that would be something like this. You're not getting what you want in life. Well, just do it. You're not working hard enough. You got to try a little bit harder. You got to do a little bit more, um, whatever the case may be. Typically, you're going to find that in uh, work type issues or um, athletics or fitness hey, you know, I want to uh, run faster, what do I need to do? Well, you just need to get out there and run more. I want to get stronger, well, you got to lift more. Um, you know, I want to make more money, well, you got to just try harder, try harder, try harder. Well, I've tried that approach, and there is some validity to that, that yes, at times we might need to uh, push a little bit more, um, but I find that approach to be incomplete for me in my experience. Also, this approach will do things like this. Well. Okay, maybe you're trying hard enough, but the plan that you're doing needs to change. Because this plan over here, this doesn't work too well, but this plan over here is, is a little bit better plan. And so I found myself switching, trying this method and this method, when they all, in fact, are pretty much the same thing. And so I found that this approach is a very masculine approach of do, 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 more, more, more. And that's why I've titled it the uh, Just Do It, or the kind of Nike. I'm, in fact, I'm wearing <laughs> their emblem in support of that. Um, but that's kind of this, the, the, the just do it approach. I've tried that, didn't work too well for me. Not that there's something we can't take away from that, and we'll discuss that in a little bit. The second approach, as I call it, is the wish upon a star approach. Um, typically, you'll find this in some other things, whether it be like um, in uh, your love life, finding, finding somebody, or other things that aren't as concrete as like making money or getting stronger, that kind of stuff, you'll find it's uh, the wish upon a star, and that is... Um, you just need to sit, meditate, send out good energy, uh, good thoughts, send out good energy into the universe, and it will come back to you. And again, I'm not making fun of it in, this, in the sense that there's no validity to it, but I find it to be incomplete. Um, typically, this is uh, just be, whereas the other one is just do. Do, 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 very masculine approach, or be, 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 a very feminine approach to um, self-sabotage, or the opposite of trying to gain some self-control. So I'm wondering if there's a way we can combine both these approaches. Yes, there's going to be some times where you're going to need to do something. You can't just sit around and, and, and meditate all day or pray all day or whatever you want to do. It just 
kind of think good thoughts. I mean, you could, and if that works for you, that's great. Then um, just keep doing it. Um, but at the same time, too, if we just continue to, to, to do things and just work harder and work harder and work harder, at what point can you no longer actually work harder? At some point, you only have so many hours in the day. At some point, you've spent money on every program you can find on how to get whatever you want. And they all tend to be the same thing, just packaged a bit differently. So is there a way we com can combine this masculine kind of approach of doing it and this feminine approach of uh, more reflection? Okay, And I think that's what I've kind of put together in this program. Um, it will become more evident with these two approaches as the lessons go on. This first lesson, again, is just to kind of get the groundwork down of what is it that we want. Um, there's a thing called the Amish prayer, which I'll, I'll say it right now in this part of the lesson. Uh, they say, pray and move your feet. And so if we called it the Zen prayer, it might be meditate and move your feet. The concept is there's going to be times that we need to self-reflect, and there are times that we're going to need to actually do something. But if we're doing all reflection and no doing, or all doing and no reflection, what's the trick? How are we getting tricked into those, those thought patterns of going, I just need to do more, or I need to just reflect more and more, but I don't need to do anything. Anyways, that's uh, been my, uh, my experience in those things. I've tried many things where I just need to, oh, I need to run harder, run faster, run longer, or I need to do nothing. I'm just going to sit around and just meditate and draw all day and... Everything will just, I'll just wake up one morning and everything will be there. That didn't work for me either. So anyways, those are two typical approaches I see out there when it comes to self-sabotage. So, section one. And by the way, we have your manual here. Um, feel free to look at it. Feel free to not look at it. Uh, section one, getting prepared. So my question is, why do we fear change? I find it important to just address that before we start on this journey of self-sabotage. What is it that I fear about changing? Well, uh, humans are pattern-seeking mammals. If you need evidence for that, uh, I would say look at the sleep rituals of a child. Um, me and my wife have a two-year-old at home, and he has some very specific rituals and things that <laughs> he has to go through uh, before bedtime. He likes these patterns. He likes these rituals of how he goes through things. And I would suspect that if you looked at your own patterns of uh, first thing you do in the morning, uh, when you get to work, whatever, you have some sort of pattern to it. So if we can consider that and say, yeah, humans do, they like patterns, could it be true that any time we go to change anything in our life, anything, we're messing with a pattern? And so there's kind of this instinctual desire to hold on to our patterns even if those patterns aren't working. And that's a surprising thing. So even if this pattern that I'm going through is not working for me, at least it's a pattern that I've been doing for the last 10, 15, 20 years, and there's this comfortability, there's this familiarity about the pattern. Um, I read in a book where this woman was uh, working with a therapist and she was afraid to change, and her quote was this, I don't want to move out of hell because I know the names of all the streets. And this woman was in an abusive relationship and if we think about that statement that she makes and ask yourself, I wonder how that relates to me. Now, you might not go, well, I'm not living in hell. I mean, my life's not like that. But consider whatever it is that we don't want or the, whatever it is we're trying to change, could it be the fear of change because it's been so familiar to us, this pattern? So before we start this, we have to actually consider that any change we make is potentially challenging to us as humans. Okay? So if we can just get that on the table and consider that, as we start going through, as we start filling these, these blocks to looking at some of these questions, these blocks to digging deeper and deeper, these blocks to actually doing some of the things, we can reflect on that and go, yeah, this is going to be a bit challenging. I remember change is tough no matter how much change we're asking for. One little thing or a great deal of change. So here's my question. Is there a way that we can fear change less and change our view of fear more? Um, when we're talking about fearing change, I'm wondering if what we're really fearing is fear. Now, I have a question. When it comes to emotions, are emotions bad or are they good? Is it right to even rank emotions like that? Would you look at someone's happiness and go, well, that's good or that's bad? 
or is it just it is? It's just happiness. Same thing with being sad. Is it good or is it bad? Is there maybe, yes, appropriate times to experience it and, and maybe less appropriate times? Sure, we could argue that, but let's say for sake of argument that an emotion, um, probably not uh, accurate to label it good or bad. It just is. So, if that's true about happiness, sadness, grief, joy, I wonder if that's true about fear as well. Is experiencing fear just a part of being human? And as we go and as we start looking into some of these questions, when we feel a sense of fear kind of well up, is it just an indication, ah, I'm human. Everybody has fear. I would think everybody has fear. And those that don't have fear probably have more denial than fear. That would just be my guess. Um, so I'm wondering if we could allow ourselves to feel fear but not be afraid of our fear. I wonder if that's possible. How does that work? L let me give you an example. Um, let's say I'm making some changes in, um, we'll say business. And I've been operating my business this way for 10 years. This is how I did all my books. This is how I did all this. This is how I did all my training, my this and this and this. I work with this new company and they come in and a uh, very professional company that I've hired to help me with my business. They go up. Oh, that, that is not the best way of doing it. You need to change this, change this, change this. And I look at that and go, yeah, they're definitely right because I hired them because things haven't been working. Um, but wow, I'm feeling afraid of changing that. Now I can do two things. I can feel that fear and go, hmm, I'm feeling some fear right now to this change. And just observe it and just see it and go, yep, that's fear. And not try to... Uh, denying, oh, no, oh, me, I'm not, I'm not afraid. Um, but at the same time, too, not get trapped into this fear cycle, but do neither of those and just step back and go, hmm, I'm feeling fear, and I'm going to try to not be afraid of feeling fear. I'm just going to accept it for what it is. I'm just feeling it right now. I'm going to observe it. So I'm wondering if that might be a better approach to the fear we sense, whether it's the fear of of change or whether it's the fear of anything. Uh, next question I have when it comes to fear. Um, when we're talking about change, what if this is true? Change really means we have to uh, work on self-control, right? I want to change this habit or this thing or this area of my life. What we're really saying is I want more self-control. When we're talking about self-control, what if it really means that we need to be more self-aware? If I'm not aware of anything, if I'm completely checked out, com completely disassociated or in denial, am I able to even work on these self-control issues that are going to promote change? Probably not. So we have change requires uh, self-control. Self-control requires self-awareness. And I wonder what's deeper after that. Could it be that in order to have self-awareness, there must be some vulnerability with self. Could that be true? I think it is for me. So if I want to be aware of why I do what I do, why do I sabotage myself, what I really need is I need to be more vulnerable. I need to take an, uh, an open and honest look at myself. And I'm wondering if, if this is true. When we fear change way up here, it's not really that we fear having to go through the processes of self-control. Probably not. It's probably not that we're really uh, afraid, per se, of, of what we're going to find out. It's the fear of really, really getting open and open and open and deeper and deeper and deeper into who we really are. That's probably, at least for me, that's probably the truth of why I fear change, is I'm really fearing what would be called intimacy with self, or vulnerability with self. So I wonder if that's true for you. So we go back to the manual here. I'm guessing that, uh, I'm going to read here. I'm guessing that we all at different times fear change, and I wonder how accurate that guess is. Uh, our time together is not about reducing fear or any other feeling that we experience. I find that to be a key point. We're not trying to reduce fear, just like any emotion. They're not bad. They're not good. We're not trying to get more of it or less of it. We're just experiencing it. If it comes up, we experience it. But to observe 
them more clearly and understand more of its possible meaning to us. So I'm wondering if we sense things, and I know we're talking about fear, but you could use this for anything. If the goal is not to go, oh, oh, I need to reduce that, that's a bad thing, or this is a good thing, I want more of it, but to just observe it, reflect on it, and go, hmm, I want to look at that more clearly, be a little bit more aware, and I, I, I'm wondering if I am curious enough to ask the question, what role does this feeling have in my life right now? Why, is it, why am I experiencing it right now? What is it trying to teach me? I find that to be a very important question for myself. So next, let's go through some possible mind traps we set for ourselves that stop us before we start. So I've listed a few down here. We could probably talk a long time about different mind traps, but basically, uh, before we start off on anything we want to change, what are some typical things that pop into our head? Let's go through the list. Number one, it won't work for me. Yeah, I know, th this program, a thousand people have done it, or this way, it, it, it probably won't work for me, though. It probably won't work for me. I'm the exception. That's a mind trap I set for myself. In fact, all eight of these, I find myself using at times. Next one, it's too complicated to understand. I don't know what this guy's talking about. What, that doesn't make any sense. It's too complicated. I would offer this to you. Um, the material um, on, on most things you're going to read or learn, hopefully with this stuff, is it really that it's too complicated? Is that really the issue? Or is it really that the material is asking you to get really deep and ask some questions that are uncomfortable? There's a bit different, there's a, there's a difference between something being complicated and something being uncomfortable. If it's uncomfortable, hey, that's fine. Uh, I've been asked many uncomfortable questions. I ask myself many uncomfortable questions that in the moment I'm like, I don't really want to answer that question. Um, but again, can I observe that and just go, hmm, it's not that it's complicated, it's that it's uncomfortable. Next one, number three, uh, how long will this take to change? Uh, you, you know, our culture and society is like, now, 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 uh, I'm going to watch this program, I'm going to do this, and I expect at the end of this program, I'm going to have changed, um, and I'm done. I never need to go through this again. Hmm, that's a mind trap for me I use a lot of times. How long is this going to take to change? Uh, number four, I'm afraid I'll do it wrong. What if this is true? You can never do it wrong. You can never do it right. You just do what you need to do to learn the lesson in the moment. And what if we took out this judgment of right or wrong and just go, however I'm going to do it is how I'm going to do it. And whether it's perceived as right or wrong by the outside, or even if I want to continue to judge it, that's okay too. But I needed it. I'm sure that if we look back on our lives, on decisions that we made that uh, we would have changed, maybe some of those decisions have been some of the best lessons. For me, they have. Some of my best lessons in life have been the ones where I go, ah, oh, I wish I would have really done that differently. It's like touching a hot stove. Sometimes we need to, to really learn the lesson. Not always, though. You don't want to run out and just keep touching the hot stove uh, unless you enjoy that. Um, so number five, what if I can't finish what I start here? That's another mind trap. Um, what if it's true that we're always on this journey and there's never a finish? You see, what that statement says, what if I can't finish what I start? <laughs> what if this is true? There's no finish. What if the real theme of this, like we talked about in the very beginning, is just creating inner awareness and understanding our responsibility? Where's the finish line in that? Where's the finish line in inner awareness? Where's the finish line in becoming more vulnerable and, and open to who we really are? There is none. And a lot of times we see things as, here's the start line, here's the finish line. When am I going to get to the finish line and no longer ever in my life sabotage myself? Uh, I think that's a mind trap, even a mind trick to think that we, there's an actual finish line. Uh, next one. Here's an interesting one. Number six. How will others view me if I change? That goes back to the, that pattern-seeking part in us, that familiarity that we have. Well, if I start changing, how is my spouse going to view me? How is my boss going to view me? How, is my friends gonna, how are my friends going to view me if I change all of a sudden? And I'm not sabotaging myself in all these various ways that everyone has uh, labeled me as. This is, this is who I am. I got all these labels. Or this person actually gets their needs met by rescuing me all the time, or I get my needs met by rescuing them all the time. Uh, some things we'll get into uh, possibly later in this lesson, but 
It's a really interesting question and a really interesting mind trap that I set for myself. Go, wow, if I change too much, how are others going to view me? Uh, number seven, how will my relationships change if I change? Another question that tags on that last one. And then uh, eight, the last one, what will I find out about myself? Hmm, that goes back to that vulnerability. And I'm wondering if we can have an increase of curiosity while we go through this lesson. If we can just be like that child and go, I just want to observe things and I'm curious about what's going on inside of me. And if we have enough curiosity, will we be able to handle or manage, whatever word you want to use, the things we learn about ourselves a little better? Again, there's going to be some patches where things might get a little uncomfortable. It's never too complicated. It's just a bit uncomfortable. And if we have enough curiosity, could that help ride us over the speed bump of being uncomfortable? For me, it does. So, can you identify with any of the, the mind traps above? And, here's an interesting question, what might be a common mind trap that you find yourself using when you seek change? So I invite you to, to answer that question for yourself. And in the manual here, you'll see um, some questions which just have a star and no line. For me, those are just more rhetorical questions. I find a lot of benefit in asking questions. Sometimes the answers are less important. In fact, most times for me, the answers are less important than the questions themselves. Um, but I did have, I did put some questions down here that the answers might be uh, quite important to actually write out. So when you're going through this manual and you see uh, a question with the line, it's an invitation to answer that question if you like. Uh, that's up to you. And I would say this, I would be very curious with myself if I, if when going through this manual, I answered this question and this question, but I didn't answer this question. I'd be very curious to know why I skipped a certain question. And could it be true that any question I skip could be more important than the other questions? There's a reason why I skipped it. Maybe, maybe not. So anyways, that's section one. We're getting prepared before we go on this journey of self-sabotage. Uh, next, section two, getting set. So now we're going to talk about what is self-sabotage. A lot of people have asked me, self-sabotage, what is that? I've never heard of that topic. Well, before we start defining that term, can you think of some public figures uh, that you, you can think of offhand that have just sabotaged their success? They've got some sort of form of success, whether it's an athlete, a politician, a movie star. You, you can open up the newspaper uh, and, and turn on the news and see these examples all the time. So just can we think in our head of some examples of people that have sabotaged themselves? A lot of examples I use are two sports figures. Uh, Tiger Woods is an obvious one. And then currently we got Lance Armstrong, who's really shown to sabotage his, his career and his life, too. Um, so what can their stories teach us about sabotaging our success? So what is it, what can we gather from that? So you can spend some time reflecting on that. Next question, what does self-sabotage mean to you? It's my personal opinion that whenever we're uh, looking into certain things, that coming to a good definition of terms is very important. Could this be true? If we don't have an understanding of what a word means, that word becomes dead. It has no value anymore. It has no meaning, and it has no ability to uh, help us communicate better. And that word is dead, and it has no, no, um, no umph to it. So if I'm using a word, self-sabotage, 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 or even the word success, as we'll see in a little bit, but I don't have a definition of it, and I have no idea what it means, that word's dead. Oh, you need to be successful. I don't even know what that means. <laughs> that word is dead to me if I don't have my own definition. And as we're going to look at, is it important to have your own definition of this term as opposed to having someone else's definition of the term? So going back to defining what self-sabotage is, I find it important to define this term so that we know what we're looking for. Oh yeah, look for your sabotaging behavior. Hey, I'm not like Tiger Woods. I'm not doing all that nonsense. I'm not like Lance Armstrong. I'm not doing all that. Well, what if self-sabotage is not always obvious? What if there are more hidden uh, ways that we sabotage. So that's why I'd like to define this word. So this is my definition. We'll just kind of, I'll throw it out there, 
but I really encourage you to come up with your own definition of what self-sabotage means to you so you can look for it in your own uh, life and behavior. So first, let's look at the word self. Obviously for me, when I look at self, it's I'm looking at this guy right here. Not at you, not at this person, not at circumstances. I go, how am I sabotaging myself? Not, it's not other sabotage or circumstantial sabotage. It's self-sabotage. So looking in, not looking out. It's the internal, not the external. Okay, But I'm looking in, but what am I looking for? I'm looking at myself. I'm looking at the mirror going, uh, okay, what does that mean? Let's consider these two things about ourselves. Let's consider there is a conscious part to us and a subconscious part to us. So uh, if we can, for just simplicity, call the conscious part of your mind, not necessarily the brain, the physical structure, but your mind, the conscious part of you, it's the I know that I know something about myself. So I know my name is Matt. I know how old I am. I know how to get home from here. I know how to turn you know, the light on, the light off. Um, I know what I ate for breakfast this morning, all those kind of things. I know that I know something about myself. Now, here's an interesting thing. Many psychologists will say that 8% of who we are resides in the conscious mind. So 8% of who I am is I know that I know something about myself. So when you say, Matt, who are you? Whatever comes out of my mouth, that's coming from my conscious mind because that's the part that speaks and has language, um, that's only 8%. That's a bit interesting. Where's that other 92%? Wow. Let's talk about it. The subconscious part, that would be 92%. And again, whether it's really 8% or 92%, who knows? Uh, it just gives us some figures to go on. The basic concept is there's a very small part of us that is conscious and there's a large part of us that's subconscious. So what is that subconscious part? Let's say for sake of argument, your subconscious part is I know that I don't know something about myself. Could that be true of our sabotaging behavior? I know that I'm sabotaging myself somehow, but I don't know why. I, I don't know why I can't just get on this exercise program. Why I can't just uh, find someone in my life. Why I can't just make more money. I know there's something in there. I just don't know what it is. Let's say that's your subconscious part. So, sabotage. So that's the self we're looking inside. Second word, sabotage. Here's my definition of sabotage in this context. The intent to misdirect or distract us from what we say we want. So here's how I view it. I say I want to go right over here. My conscious mind says, yep, that's the way I want to go. And I start, whoop, yep. And I just get nudged and nudged and nudged. I keep walking though. I'm, I'm still doing, going. And next I wind up over here going, this is not the direction I was facing originally. What happened? And it's just small little nudges. It could be big nudges too. And we'll find out the four different ways of sabotage. But most times it's just to distract us and, and, and get us off our path. I don't view uh, self-sabotage as uh, a way to really destroy our lives. I really view it as this. If you know anything about par uh, parasite infections, when a parasite is inside of you and living in you, you are the host. It doesn't want you dead because it's going to die most likely or it's going to have to find somebody else to uh, live inside. But it doesn't want you healthy either because a healthy body will push out that parasite. It wants you just sick enough that it can thrive as you're barely surviving. So what if that's true about self-sabotage? There's parts of us that don't really want us destroyed. They're not trying to really ruin your life per se, uh, but they don't want you to do too well. Might that be true of what's really going on in these parts of our mind? So going back to the conscious and subconscious parts of our mind, what if this is true? My conscious mind says, I want to lose 10 pounds. That's my goal. Lose 10 pounds. 8% of me wants this, by the way. My subconscious part says, oh, no, 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 no. No, I don't want to lose 10 pounds. So if I have 8% of anything voting yes and 92% of anything voting no, uh, what part do you think is going to win out? Hmm. And might that be what's happening in our sabotaging behavior. And now here's the interesting thing. There can be parts of your life that uh, you're, you're not sabotaging yourself and parts that you are. 
And it's those parts that we want to look at. Why am I sabotaging myself in this part? Why is it that I can't find love, but I can find money? Or I, I, can't, uh, I, I can find love, but I can't find money? Or whatever the issue is. I would say most of us don't sabotage ourselves in everything imaginable, just in bits and pieces. And it might be the same bits or pieces for years and years and years, or it might change. I find myself kind of changing. Every couple of years, like, ah, it's my subconscious part, by the way. Uh, I think I'm going to sabotage something else in this guy's life. Um, that's always interesting. So can we define self-sabotage as this? It is the process when one part of us does not want what the other part wants. We're having a conflict. I don't want this, but I want this. There's a large part over here and a small part over here, and they're doing this. Okay, so let's give self-sabotage, if we can, just a, a more kind of user-friendly definition. What if self-sabotage really is this? Getting in your own way. So when I say I want this and I'm going, and I bump up against something over and over, and there's some guy standing there with his back turned to me, and I'm like, hey, get out of the way. I'm supposed to, I want to get over there. And he turns around, oh my gosh, <laughs> that's me. Why am I in my own way? That's what we're here to discover. Why am I in my own way? And how can I get myself out of my way and get this other part of me in agreement, congruent with what I say I want? So next, in dealing with self-sabotage, let's. Um, is there a way we can take a task and break it down? Let's say we can break it down into three ways. You could break it down into many different ways, but let's say we could break it down into three. One is creating. Second is planning and three is doing. So before you, you uh, do it, complete a task or even start a task, you have to create it in your mind. I want to lose 10 pounds. I had to have the thought to do that first, okay? Next, after I create that, I then have to plan it out, okay? Well, what am I gonna do to do it? Once I plan it out, then I actually have to do it. So we got creating, planning, and doing. So, uh, we're looking to go, we're, the reason we're looking at this is to go, okay, what part of the task kind of process am I sabotaging myself in? I find it to be very important to get real specific and really looking at, okay, where? What is self-sabotage and where am I doing it? Because you're not going to always do it the same way. You might, even that's important. Am I always sabotaging myself in the doing phase, the planning phase, or the creating phase? So let's say that you find it hard to, uh, number one down here. Do you find it hard to figure out what you want to accomplish or what you want in life? When I say, what do you want? And you go, hmm, uh, I, I don't know. Hmm. Are you sabotaging yourself in the creation phase? You can't even create the thought. If you can't create the thought, it's possible you're sabotaging yourself in the very beginning. Okay? Uh, next, number two. Do you find yourself dreaming of things you want to accomplish but are left without any real way of making it happen? So, we can call this person the dreamer. Has a lot of great ideas. Oh, I'm gonna do this, and I'm gonna do this, yeah. And then next, after that, I'm gonna do this, and this, and this, and this, and this. And you go, oh, those are great ideas, Matt. Have you mapped out, and do you have any plan on how you're gonna do all 10 of those things in the next 30 minutes? Uh, no, no. But I, I, I'm gonna think of another 10 things tomorrow to put on this list of, of creating. This is the dreamer. A lot of great ideas, but there's no actual plan. If you were to ask them, how are you going to get that accomplished? There's no concrete plan on how to do it. Um, number three, do you find yourself writing out plans, committing to programs initially, only then to stop midway or even stop before you start? Okay, this is the person that they create a lot of ideas. They get the spreadsheets. Oh, yeah, I, I, I've got this computer program that I put in and it maps it and then I got this uh, this app on my phone that it's gonna do this too for me and I got oh yeah I got this this post it here and this paper posted over here to remind me to do this and my whole work area or my my house has got just post it's everywhere oh this is planned out I start tomorrow morning I can't wait and then three days later why haven't I started yet Okay, this is a problem in the doing phase. So I find it important to go, okay, what, what part of these phases am I sabotaging myself in? So let me use an example. I think I used this example in another video I did on where this shows up, we'll say, in finding a significant other in our life. 
Sabotaging ourselves in the creation phase would be, I know I want somebody, but I just can't even spend time thinking about that right now. I, I just, I got too much going on. There's a part of me that, yes, would like to find someone to spend my time with or spend my life with or w whatever the case is, but I just can't even entertain the thought of doing that. I got too much work to do. I got too, da, 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 da. You're sabotaging yourself in the creation phase. Here's the next person. Sit around and dreaming of love all day. Ah, oh, I just want to find someone. Ah, oh, this, all that. And your friend says, ah, oh, what have you, have you done anything? Have you gotten on some of those uh, match.coms or this or met with people or, 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 or have you done anything to actually do it? No, no, but I just wish I could find love. Okay, you're sabotaging yourself perhaps in the planning phase. Last one, the doing phase. Um, you're creating it. You've got the thought, yeah, well, I want to. I want to find somebody. You're out there. You, you get up on the website. You pay your fee to get on there. You might even, you know, have interactions with people via email or phone. But when it comes to actually meeting with them, mm, I don't know about that. I'm just kind of enjoying sitting back here behind the computer or on the phone. Um, it could be you're sabotaging yourself in the doing phase. That's just a quick example. You could use that example for a lot of things. Use it for exercise or whatever. Okay, so um, here's an interesting question. Who else, other than public figures or athletes, do you know or know of that have and do sabotage their success? So, is there someone else you know? Yes, we get it. You know, Lance Armstrong, Tiger Woods, the newspaper, People Magazine, all that stuff. You can look on there and go, oh my gosh, this is like the, the saboteur's digest here. That's all it is. is people sabotaging their life. Are there other people, though, that might be doing it? People not in public life. People you know that you might be able to look at and not to look at to judge per se, although you can if you, you want to or you need to, but we're looking at it just to observe and go, hmm, what can I take away from that? What does that reflect back to me? Um, my next question, could there be a broad range of behavior that is sabotaging? It's not just you've ruined your life and you've ruined your marriage and you've ruined your health, but could it be a broad range? What do you think are some obvious or extreme examples of self-sabotage? I would invite you to, to answer that question, whether you want to pause the video here or go back and answer it later. But I think it's important, at least it has been for me, to write down, okay, what are, what are some obvious extreme examples? And the next question, what are some less obvious or mild examples? Just to get my brain thinking and reflecting on, yeah, there's, there is a wide variety of ways that we sabotage ourselves. And here's a really interesting question after you answer those two, if you like. Could it be true that they have the same root cause? Could it be true that no matter how you sabotage yourself, it all distills itself down into the same root cause? I think that may be true. So... Self-sabotage tends to come in four ways. I'm sure there could be a fifth or a sixth, but let's just go with these four today. Number one, being obvious. These are big ways, okay? Big, big ways. Uh, drinking too much, getting a DUI, uh, going to jail for the weekend, losing your job, um, ruining your marriage, kids hate you because you, you're drunk. Okay, that's a pretty obvious way that you're sabotaging your, yourself. How about being subtle. These would be small ways. What if this is true? Let's use sleep as an example. You know you should get to bed at a certain time. We'll say that that time is 10 o'clock or whatever. We'll just make up a number here. Um, and you know that you do better when you get to bed at 10 and you wake up at 6. And you know you do better. I mean, you know this when you get eight hours of sleep. Whether you've read the books that tell you to do better or you just done it enough to know, yeah, I know I just... I have a more productive day at work. I, I feel less anxious. I, I just, just feel a lot better. Um, 10 o'clock comes. You look at the clock. Uh, 10.30. I mean, what's the big deal? Sure, what's the big deal? It's 30 minutes. But what if that 30 minutes now is not just one day or two days. It's 30 days. It's 60 days. And now that 30 minutes becomes 35 minutes or 40 minutes. Could that be another way to sabotage yourself in a very subtle way? So that tomorrow when you go to work, you're not your best. You feel more anxious. I would say for me, I have shifted gears from being very obvious in my youth on how I sabotage myself to being very subtle. And I find that most people identify self-sabotage with being, oh, it's very obvious. But I have a question for you. Could it be true that most of us, even the people that are sabotaging themselves in obvious ways, if you really walked with them for 24 hours, 
most of us are probably very, very subtle on how we sabotage and get in our own way. That might be true. Next one, number three, being direct. This is by doing something. I'll use food as an example. As an example. Uh, I'm on a diet. Been on it for three days. Oh, there's cake and cookies and ice cream and all that kind of stuff. Well, I'm going to have some. I'm sabotaging myself, and I'm not just going to have some. I'm going to have a whole lot of some. I'm doing something to sabotage. How about uh, the fourth one being indirect? Can I sabotage myself by not doing something? By not making a choice? Am I making a choice to sabotage myself? That's an interesting question. Let's use uh, eating again. So I know that I'm, I'm trying to get healthy, I'm trying to be on this diet, whatever it is, but I just am not eating breakfast. Just not doing it. Even though I know I feel better when I do, and uh, I read all the research or whatever, I've been told to eat breakfast, but I'm just not doing it. So can I sabotage myself by not doing something? So the four ways again, obvious, subtle, direct, and indirect. There's big ways, there's small ways, there's things we do and things we don't do. So can you think of some ways in which people sabotage themselves in each of these four categories? Are you able to spot the times, meaning creating, planning, and doing, and the ways, obvious, subtle, direct, or indirect, that you get in the way of your own plans? Hmm. It's an interesting question to consider. How am I doing either in those three parts of, of the, the task or the goal and in those different four ways? Next question. What goal or plan have you made recently that you find yourself having a hard time accomplishing? Would you like to write that down? Do you have any guesses as to what, as to what may be stopping you? Now, I find these two questions to be very, very uh, important for me. And um, these are questions that, trust me, once you answer them once, um, you can't answer them too many times. To reflect back on these two questions um, has been very important for me, looking at my own sabotaging behavior. I've asked myself, okay, how am, I, how am I getting in my own way right now? And what specifically? And then once I figure that out, I go, hmm, I wonder why I'm doing that. Hmm, 